Welcome to McKinley uh, School for this community meeting to talk about the situation, the faults that have been discovered passing under San Rafael Elementary School. I appreciate all of you joining us on a Thursday evening. Uh, have a great panel up here today. We have uh, Superintendent uh, John Gundry, uh, Chief of Facilities David Azcaraga, uh, Dr. Lucy Jones from the United States Geological Survey, uh, Terry Tao, who's an expert on these issues regarding uh, seismic issues in, in schools, um, and then also for available for questions, uh, Brian McDonald, who will be up there shortly, who's our chief academic officer, and David Davis, who's the emergency preparedness coordinator for the district. Um, we're gonna have them do their presentation, and then following that, we're gonna be doing questions. Um, we had cards out there um, for questions and comments. I'll be collecting those. I'll also be passing those out during. Promise you we'll get to uh, as many as we can, but certainly the major topics that are out there. So without further ado, introduce our superintendent, John Gundry. Who we need his mic on. Is that it? Okay. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to uh, acknowledge one of our board members is with us here tonight. Uh, Scott Phelps is sitting over here. Are there any other board members present? I think Mr. Phelps is the only one. Okay, um, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about uh, what, what we're doing here because I think that's going to be uh, David's presentation. So when David As Ascaraga presents, I think he will explain the background to you. Some of you are already aware that, that we have uh, discovered uh, some active fault lines under the San Rafael campus, and David will explain what that means, how that happened, how it was discovered, what it means, and, uh, and we'll give you a, a relatively detailed explanation uh, of the situation. So uh, I would just like to say that the purpose of this meeting tonight is to inform the public about what's going on and also to give you an opportunity to give us feedback, uh, ask questions. And I know that I have talked to uh, several people in the room already about this and uh, we, we also will be discussing, uh, taking your feedback on the, the process of informing the public and, and the timeline for making a decision, because I know that there's some feeling that the timeline for making a decision is aggressive. And so that, that's also uh, up for discussion. We're not absolutely tied to our timeline. I think the, the purpose for trying to put an aggressive timeline out there was so that we could have a decision, so that we could be clear on where we were going moving forward. But if the public feels that we need more time, I don't think that there'd be a problem with extending the timeline and having additional opportunities uh, to gather public input. But we can uh, take your comments on that after the presentation is done. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to uh, our facilities chief, David Ascarga. Thank you, Mr. Gundry. Can you hear me? All right. Um, let me go through a little bit of um, the agenda, who's going to be speaking so you get a sense of the order and who's going to be coming up. Uh, I'm going to make some comments on the background, how we got to where we are today. Uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Jones to talk a little bit in general about uh, the seismic issues, the safeties. Uh, Dr. Jones has a unique perspective. She's actually a community member and she had her kids at uh, San Rafael. So she has a very personal uh, side that she can address. Uh, I'm going to have Mr. Terry Tao also talk a little bit about the legal issues. Um, Mr. Terry Tao, he's both an attorney as well as a licensed architect. He's worth gold. Um, I've used uh, Terry Tao for about the last 15 years. Uh, Terry and I, uh, actually, we were just reminiscing when this came up. Uh, in one of my previous districts in Northern California, we discovered about a half a dozen schools that were straddled on the San Andreas Fault. And so we've gone down this path. We understand the responsibilities and we understand the course of action that needs to, uh, to be taken. So he's very knowledgeable and he'll talk to us a little bit about uh, the legal obligations, what we must do, and what we do not have to do uh, so that we have a better understanding. I'm gonna come back and then I'm gonna talk to you about five options that we have uh, identified that we wanna share with the community. And uh, I wanna clarify that today it's only information. We're gonna share with you what we know. We're gonna share with you how long ago it was that we found this out, what we've done since we found out. 
and then the processes that we're going to follow. Essentially, we're going to have a series of community meetings after this. The community meetings will be an opportunity for everybody in the community to then provide us feedback, look at the options, vote on it, tell us. We'll put all the options on boards. You'll have stickies. You can make comments. You can say that's a crazy idea, or I like that idea, or there's an idea that you have not addressed. And that's the opportunity for us to get as much feedback and information so that we can formulate a report that will go back to the board. Okay? Um, I want to point out, uh, the superintendent alluded to it, that the timelines that we have were to be as expedient as possible in getting the information to you. The action is going to be determined by the board and by consultants and what the next steps are. Nothing is in concrete, and you'll hear comments from both Dr. Jones and Mr. Tao in terms of what our obligations are. So you will see some hypothetical dates and comments, uh, suggested timeline that we are putting down there because our task was to formulate a plan. Um, and so with that, let me get started. If I could, I'd like to ask you to, um, if you have questions, uh, get a three by five card from Hilda in the back, if everybody, Hilda, can you just raise your hand, make sure everybody sees uh, Hilda? Get a three by five card, please write them down. Then we'll collect all the cards and sort them through and find out who's the best person to answer. Is it a legal issue? Is it a seismic issue? Is it an academics issue? Is Dr. McDonald gonna be addressing the academics? With me for my staff, I've got two people sitting behind me that I do wanna acknowledge, Mr. Robin Brown. He is the bond manager. He's overseeing the bond construction work. He is very knowledgeable about the project and also uh, Marla. Marla Nodoni is the owner representative assigned to this particular school. She's an architect by training and she's assigned to oversee the construction. She was the one that coordinated all the tests that you're gonna see that discovered uh, the anomalies, okay? So let me get started. Again, we're here to talk about San Rafael Elementary, the seismic faults. This is probably the most interesting uh, uh, drawing that we've been using uh, so far. And uh, let me try and go, and, and I know it's a little hard, so I'll try to see if I can uh, circle for you. The legend on the right, let me back up. The legend on the right, where is the, there we go, starts in 2000. And uh, that was going back to measure Y. There was three borings that were done related to building ramps. And those three borings were here, here, and another boring here. They weren't seismic borings. They were related to what is the composition of the soil. The state wants to know uh, the density, what type of soil is down there before you build a concrete ramp. So those uh, tests were done. The ramps were built. Then in 2004, uh, they were thinking about doing an elevator. And so additional borings were required by the state and that was in anticipation of doing an elevator that did not get completed under Measure Y. But borings were done. They wanted to know what's, what's the soil composition, what does it look like, uh, and that project was deferred to Measure TT. That work was not done, but the tests were done. Then in 2009 was the beginning of Measure TT. Uh, the hand augers that were done are actually in support of this shade structure. That was done. They were looking at the soil, the weight of the, the structure. Uh, what does that look like? That was the beginning of, of Measure TT projects. In 2011, the state asked us to do a series of borings. We did three borings, and they're actually in green. There's one here, one there, and one over here. That was seismic. The state wanted to know, and I will show you a drawing in a little while that shows all the faults that are around us. There are really quite a few faults in this part of, of Los Angeles. And they wanted to know what's underneath there. So we did three tests. Um, going back, I believe it's in March, and I've got a timeline where we go into details that talk exactly uh, the dates. But that uh, raised the, uh, the concern of the state. They said, this is interesting. We see an anomaly. We want more tests. They directed that we do 12 tests, and those, wrong button, new gadget. Those tests are these blue and red. There was about a dozen tests that were done. So they said, instead of doing borings, we want you to do what is called cone penetration test. Smaller, deeper. Go down and do a whole bunch of them. And we want you to test this general area because we think there may be something going on, but we don't know. So we complied. We did those tests. That was done around September of uh, 2011. We came back with those results. We gave them to the state, and the, and the state said, very interesting, we want more tests. So they ordered us to do uh, what 
commonly known as like an ultrasound. That is uh, the S wave seismic reflection line. That is this long line that was done. And every few feet, you've got to get absolute quiet. You get a permit from the city, and they actually do like an ultrasound. It's non-destructive, but it, it, whenever the test comes back, it looks like an ultrasound for uh, whenever you're you know, uh, doing it with a doctor. That tells you the depth, and it, what you're looking for is an anomaly. The soil is supposed to look uniform, and it's somewhere along the line there's an anomaly, and that will pick it up. So the borings that we did and the tests we did proved that there was some sort of an anomaly. We don't know what it is, but at a certain depth, the soil doesn't look the same as it does a few feet down. So we did that test. We gave it to the state, and they said, there's an anomaly here, but we want to see the other end of it. So they ordered a second ultrasound to be done, and that is this line down here. That took a couple of months because we had to shut the street down. We had to get a permit, go to the city, and shut it down. That second line was done. Those uh, tests were done between November of 11 and February of 2012. When we finished that, and I'll show the timeline, the state said, very interesting, now get a peer review. Peer review is you get an independent third party and you get somebody else to look at your findings to validate what you've got. Do you have a seismic fault or is it just some anomaly that can't be you know, defined? So that is what has triggered all of, all of the activity. I want to show you this map. This is San Rafael. These are some of the known faults that we have around. As you can tell, the elementary school sits in the middle of what is called the San Andrea Fault. Eagle Rock Fault splits off over here. Hollywood Fault is down in this area. The Raymond Fault is down in this area. Uh, so the whole community, and this is just part of, of the district, obviously, there's faults all around. Uh, you're going to hear Dr. Jones talk a little bit about faults, the age of the faults. We believe that these faults are at least 10 to 20,000 years old. The point here is we didn't, we didn't build a school and a fault creeped in underneath us. A community was built on faults that have been here for thousands of years. The school is no more in danger today than it was yesterday, a day before, a year ago, or probably a thousand years ago. But we have discovered uh, what appears to be some active lines and uh, we have a responsibility to, to take action. Okay? At this point, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Jones if she'd come up. Thank you. Um, I was just asked to come and provide perspective on it, having being able to understand uh, a range of the issues. And just uh, almost 20 years ago, I had my son at San Rafael, so I know the school quite well. Um, I am a seismologist. I work for the U.S. Geological Survey, which is a uh, the, the federal agency with the primary responsibility for doing earthquake hazards and, and geologic warnings as, as we can uh, for the United States. And I've been here in Pasadena uh, at Caltech for almost 30 years. I also spent the last 10 years, um, much of the last 10 years, serving on the State Seismic Safety Commission. And as part of that, that is the Again, a, a, an advisory group at the state level, uh, the commissioners are all appointed by, by the governor uh, to give advice to the legislature and the governor on seismic issues. And as part of that, I got to know a lot about the, um, the laws and the, the rationale and the approach to ha trying to handle earthquake issues for schools. And in fact, I chaired the subcommittee on school safety and have written a couple of reports about it and spent a lot of time uh, investigating how it's done in California and where the issues are. Um, from that perspective, um, this school is, is very near uh, a significant fault. I knew that uh, when uh, our kids were there, uh, and it bothered me, but not enough to take them away from a, a, a teacher that was doing a lot of good. Um, this One thing to know about faults, <laughs> There are, there are several hundred active faults in Southern California, so you can't get very far away from them when you live here. Most of them move relatively infrequently. This class of faults, the Raymond Fault, Hollywood, San Rafael, Eagle Rock, all are in the category of having an earthquake once every thousand years, once every few thousand years. Right? So if they're not very common, but when they happen, uh, it can be very devastating. The other thing is that when an earthquake happens on a fault, you have a slip on the fault that produces shaking as one of its effects. 
So everybody receives that shaking. It's travel, you know, just like when I snap my fingers, I've moved my fingers, but I cause the air to vibrate and that vibration passes out across the room. Same thing on the fault, you move on the fault and the waves travel out to everyone. So everyone has to be able to handle the earthquake shaking. And that's where we have building codes that help us uh, you know, build buildings strong enough to not fall down. Schools, K-12 schools in California are different than any other building. They're covered by something called the Field Act that was passed exactly one month after the 1933 Long Beach earthquake completely destroyed 70 schools and only did not kill a lot of children because the schools weren't in session. The earthquake happened at 6 o'clock at night. So don't believe they all happened in the early morning, by the way. All right, that, and since then, every school in California has to go through a process of somewhat stronger standards than um, the building code in general recommends, but most importantly, what's called plan check and review. When your building, when your house got built, an inspector would show up maybe a couple of times during the process and check what's going on. When a school is built, there's an inspector on site every moment of construction, watching everything that goes on. And the engineers that are expert in this say that's probably the most important thing in making the building safe. And it's something you can't go and retrofit later. I said it's applied to every building since 1933. Of course, San Rafael was, born, was built in 1918. Now, after the Kern County earthquake damaged a lot of older school buildings, there was an amendment put in in which they mandated getting retrofitting done on all the older buildings. And that was done for San Rafael, I don't know the exact date, probably late 50s, early 60s. That makes the building safer than it would have been just being a brick building. But it is not nearly as safe as what we do now when we build a school. So it is definitely a lower level of construction than what we have in most of the other schools in, 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 you know, in the state, in Pasadena, anywhere, because it was built before the Field Act went into place. I knew that as well when my kid was there. Um, it also bothered me. The more I found out about the Field Act and how, what a difference it's made, it made me realize that this is a pretty big issue. So it's very important, to, if you were going to try to use that, continue to use the building, that it should be brought up to more modern standards. And that's where this process got invoked when a school district's going to build a new school or retrofit a school, they have to check out what are the local faults. And the California Geological Survey said, we have the mapped Eagle Rock Fault. We can see it at the Eagle Rock. We can see it at, in the Arroyo at the La Loma Bridge. You draw a line between those two and it passes awfully close to San Rafael. There's probably, there's an active fault pretty nearby. Um, and that was what these studies led to, was finding out exactly where it passes through. And of course, as you've heard, it turns out that the strands are actually running through the building. And another philosophy of school safety that I think has been a, a, an important way of doing it is the earthquakes don't happen often enough for us to panic and go and tear down every pre-existing building and rebuild it and do the whole thing over. They do happen often enough that you don't invest more money in a new school or new construction in a dangerous location. We know more now, and when you go to do the retrofitting and do the upgrade, you avoid the really big faults. The reason not, you don't want to build directly on the fault, I realized I got distracted and didn't finish this, when I said that the shaking affects everybody, and that's the Field Act is really addresses that for schools, but when you're actually on the fault, it literally moves during the earthquake. And in 1971, in the San Fernando earthquake, there were a lot of homes that were torn in half because one side of the building moved with respect to the other because the fault literally ran through the building. There is no way to build a building safely when you're literally straddling the fault. The foundation is ripped apart. The walls are ripped apart. You can't keep it up. Right? And after that time, there was something brought in called the Aquas Priolo Act, where we're no longer allowed to build new construction of certain types on a fault. You can still build a single family house on a fault. It has to be disclosed to you, and you've got to make your own decisions. But you can't build a development of more than four homes. You can't build a school. You can't build a, build a store. You can't build a hospital. You know, places where people are going to be congregating, you don't want to have a guaranteed 
It's really unlikely that earthquake's going to happen, but when it does, you know the building has to come down. And so that's the situation that got invoked by discovering that the fault literally runs through the school. And, um, you know, you, the state law says that when you're in that situation, you cannot build within 50 feet of that active trace. And that's because we can see the trace, but when the next earthquake comes through, sometimes it wiggles around a bit. And 50 feet gives you a barrier so you don't have it being ripped apart by the next earthquake. Um, I think that that's a, enough for now. I'll be able to answer questions later. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Terry Tao. Let's see. Forgive me. There we go. I'm Terry Tao. I'm one of the attorneys with the law firm of Atkinson Anelson. The reason I am involved, I'm a lawyer, uh, we represent a lot of school districts and we've had a number of school districts go through this exact scenario before. Um, what happens is, what we look at is really an issue of have we encountered a situation where there is an unsafe condition and when you're looking at an issue of an active earthquake fault, then it's considered an unsafe condition. Now, there's been some questions that have been raised about, okay, is this actually an active earthquake fault? We know that in the California Geological Survey that there are the, the various surveys that are out there, it shows faults nearby and perhaps very close to where the San Rafael School is, but we don't know for certain until the testing is done. Now that we've done the testing, it appears that there's an active earthquake fault. Now, the reason why we say it appears to be an active earthquake fault is there's only one authority that can determine whether the fault is active, and these reports have now been sent off to uh, this authority, which is California Geological Survey. They will make the determination, but we're very certain that, that we're going to have to act once that determination is made, and based on the data that we see, it looks like we're going to end up with an active earthquake fault situation. There's a government code, and I won't spend a lot of time on legal stuff. Government code section 830.6 is the design immunity statute. It's a very tough statute for school districts because with Field Act, Field Act requires schools to be at a higher standard. In some conditions, the schools are at 19-fold higher seismic requirements than those of other buildings that surround. In, uh, after the 1972 earthquake that occurred, um, there was a substantial beefing up of the requirements associated with the lateral uh, design for buildings. And that's when many of the side-to-side um, -side motion issues, uh, what's called lateral issues, were addressed within the building code. School districts are held to a higher standard. We are charged with the care of students. So once we become aware of a potentially unsafe condition, the school district is required to act. In fact, government code section 830.6 has such a high standard for school districts and school district officials, the failure to act results in personal liability for the school district board members. That's how high the liability is if there is just a refusal to acknowledge an unsafe condition and a refusal to try to do something about the unsafe condition. And that's one of the reasons why the moment we became aware of the situation, even before the declaration of active, based on the information that we have, we made sure that this information is brought out to you so you're aware of it, so that when the determination is made and the school district becomes eligible uh, for state funding, becomes eligible for uh, the ability to, um, to tap into some of the state funding for the purposes of building new locations, upgrading, whatever the case may be, based on some of the options that are going to be presented, that we have that available to us. One of the things that I want to emphasize, and I think is probably pretty obvious to you, 
We didn't move the school to an earthquake fault. The earthquake fault was there. The school got built there. The science wasn't there at the time when the school, built, the school was built way back uh, in the early part of the 20th century. And uh, now the science has improved and we know based on our testing that there um, are faults that are likely to be declared active faults there. And that's why we've, we've come forward with you on that. Some of the other things that become um, significant is some of, the, some of the questions that have come up are, for example, the code does not require us to simply close the school. It says that we can't construct within 50 feet of an active earthquake fault. But the reality is the San Rafael School is an older school. So you can't just leave the school as it is. It requires upgrades, it requires uh, ongoing construction, and you have a second issue. And this is a little bit less legal, a little bit more of just a, um, a responsibility issue. With Government Code Section 830.6, the school district now is aware because of the reporting that we had to do when it became time to do the elevator and we had to do the testing that uh, Mr. Ascaria just went through. We are now aware of the earthquake faults, and should there be an earthquake, we need to make sure that we plan for that. And that's one, why some of the options are being considered, and that's why some of the uh, issues are being addressed. The place where liability and responsibility really becomes significant for the school district is here. What happens is, if the school district does nothing, that's when the liability starts to become significant for not only the school district, but also becomes a problem for the kids that we, we are charged with. Um, I'm sure we'll have other questions as they come up. Uh, we have a lot of uh, issues with regard to how states deal with state funding. Uh, there is a code section with regard to state funding for if there is a um, what's called an unsafe condition, especially if there's an active earthquake fault. And um, that is one of the pieces that the district will be working its way through. And that's also addressed in some of the options. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. A couple of comments that I wanted to make before I get into the options. Um, we're significantly, significantly into Measure TT projects. This is the first school that we've ever encountered this uh, type of scenario where there's some sort of a soils anomaly. Uh, and we've done testing at every school that we have to modernize. The state requires us to do borings and testing everywhere. We've done testing in anticipation of the work that's gonna go on here. In anticipation of the work that went on at Blair Middle School, we had to do extensive testing. One of the options you're gonna look at is Ellendale. Allendale is right across the street from Blair. So we know that that's an option because we just tested right across the street and we know what's there. We're preparing to do work at Washington. We're preparing to do work at Sierra Madre. So at no other place have we found any evidence of any active fault lines. And so I know that's a question that some people have asked and they wonder, well, have you done the test? We've done the test, we have the results. This is the first school that we have that uh, scenario. Um, a couple of words that Terry uh, said, and to me, they're questions that triggered my mind. Uh, the word active fault line, as most of us say, active fault line is within the last 10,000 years. I was absolutely bored a few nights ago, and it's actually 11,700 years. They, they consider any activity in the last 11,700 years to be active. Um, it's not to the layperson, you say active, you think, well, it must have just happened in my lifetime. Okay. First thing that I want to bring to everybody's attention is what is the money? How much money have we got? One of the things that the state does not force you to do is go bankrupt to move out. They don't overreact. They don't say, get the money take all the money that you have from another project. Um, they work with you and they identify funding options. What we have at San Rafael, based on the 2012 Facilities Master Plan, which is the most current budget, there is $5,300,000 5, available to work with. 
So uh, I want to go through some timelines real briefly. We've talked uh, about most of them already. In March of 2011, uh, the California Geological Survey, CGS, uh, they requested that we did test. Uh, they requested that, subsequently, they requested a cone test penetration, CPT. September of 2011, uh, we submitted them to CGS, and that indicated some anomalies. Uh, in October of 2011, they asked for additional tests in between November of 2011 and February of 2012, we did those ultrasound tests. In March 30th of 2012, we received uh, the draft geophysical study, and it indicated four fault lines. We submitted peer review immediately. On May the 7th, peer review came in and indicated you've got far, four fault lines. We agree with your findings. The very next day, the superintendent and staff briefed the Board of Education. That started this process. Um, May the 8th, which was last Tuesday, uh, to today, in the last two weeks, we briefed the, the board. We sent out a letter from the superintendent. We met with the leadership of San Rafael. There was a press conference on May the 11th. A website went live with every document that we have available to us so that you could see it and, and review it. Um, at the request of the parent leadership at uh, San Rafael, they asked to see two of the options, Linda Vista and Allendale. We conducted a tour. These are the four, uh, five options that we have. And uh, we have come up with five options. Some of them are way outside the box. Some of them are very obvious. They're not ranked in any priority of, of importance. They are ranked from the least expensive to most expensive. So the cheapest option, the least expensive option, would be to simply close the school. Uh, the concerns that we have is obviously the dual language program that's thriving at that school. Uh, the students would need to be dispersed among the various campuses in the district. The earliest that that could possibly happen would be 13, 14 school year. It, it is not recommended to close the school immediately and do it next year. Um, there is no funding available to simply close the school. The state will give you some funding critical hardship money, uh, depending on certain circumstances. If you're not going to build anything, they're not going to give you a penny. Uh, we believe that moving costs would be about $150,000 to move, relocate, based on what we just experienced, closing Burbank and Loba Alta. Uh, we have $5.3 million. There would be a little over $5 million surplus available uh, in that option. Option, uh, the next option that we have is to relocate the school to Allendale. Allendale is across the street from Blair Middle School, Blair High School. Um, it is currently being used by Blair High School right now. Some of the classrooms are being used, I believe, music. There's a couple of programs there. The campus, Allendale, is part of the planning for temporary campus. It's called Swing Space. In other words, we're going to do, we finished the middle school, we're going to do the high school, the ninth grade wing, uh, a couple of other projects there. So part of the savings, keeping the cost down, is using Allendale as a temporary campus. Um, the work, we hope, uh, will actually start in the winter of uh, this year. We would recommend uh, improvements to Allendale. It's not absolutely necessary, but it's an old school and it should have some renovations. Um, we believe that the best case scenario would be in the 14-15 school year. Uh, it might be available if we did not do modernization. If we did modernization at the earliest, we believe it would be 15-16. Because it is an existing site, we would not qualify for state funding. Here's the cost breakdown. We believe there's at least, a, uh, based on an assessment that was already done at Allendale, we believe it's at least $4.2 million in needs that, that should and could be done there as improvements. We have a budget of 5.3, uh, so we have a surplus of a little over a million dollars under that scenario. And I asked for maps so that people could understand. Obviously, there's San Rafael in the upper left, and that's Allendale. It's about 2.6 miles away from the campus. Another option is to relocate to Linda Vista. Linda Vista is currently a surplus property. It is closed. Um, it would involve an impact to the child care program that's there. We lease a, a portion of it to a child care program. And the city uses the park in the back. We'd have to talk about what the city would do. Would they stay after hours? First priority, obviously, would be to our kids during school hours. Uh, there is some repairs that would need to be done to the main academic building, the administration building, rather, and classrooms. Uh, an assessment was done in 2007. We have a pretty good idea of what that would cost. Uh, there would have to be some ADA um, uh, improvements. 
in the drop-off and playground access, we would need to build a two-story building. The school will not accommodate the population that we have at San Rafael. We'd have to grow. And because of the size, the layout, and the, 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 the layout of the campus, it has a lower section that goes down. We would probably have to build a two-story building. And you should know, I'll refer back to it, uh, the cost here, depending on whether it's a one-story or two-story, goes up. It's more expensive to build multi-story buildings than a, than a single story. So at the earliest, we believe, uh, if we were to get to work, if we were given the mandate to get on this, this is our option. The earliest, we believe, would be 14-15 school year. We would be eligible because we're doing new construction. The state would provide some um, critical hardship, facilities hardship. We believe we'd be eligible for uh, two and a quarter million dollars. We estimate that modernization based on a $380 per square foot cost, modernizing an existing facility would cost about $6.6 .6 million. A new facility based on a square footage cost of $540 per square foot will cost an additional $5.6 million. We believe the cost to renovate and make improvements and prepare Linda Vista is about $12.3 million. We believe we could get uh, $2.2 million from the state. There's a budget of $5.3 we're short $4.77 million. This gives you a sense of where San Rafael is. Linda Vista is directly north of San Rafael. It's approximately 2.9 million, uh, 2.9 miles away. Another option is to build a campus, a brand new campus at the District Service Center. District Service Center is like the courtyard. It's where the maintenance, the, the bond team is located there. The District Warehouse Food Service uh, is operated out of the District Service Center. Um, it is a more lo uh, remote location for the population. We might have to do some busing to get our kids there. Uh, the elementary school uh, would be located right behind Muir. It would be close to a high school. Uh, a two-story building would need to be built there to accommodate. Uh, it is uh, relatively close proximity. It's about a block away. The district service center is about a block, block and a half away from Jackson Elementary School. Uh, the site at the earliest would be available in the 15-16 school year. We believe we would be eligible for a higher level of uh, hardship funding, possibly $4.4 million. We believe on a square footage of $540 per square foot cost, uh, it would cost nearly $19 million to build a school there. Uh, if we receive $4.4 million from the state and our budget of five point three, we would be short $4.2 million. This gives you a sense of where the District Service Center, it is uh, Woodbury in 210. It is 4.5 miles away from San Rafael. Another option that is there is to build on campus. Uh, as was indicated by Dr. Jones, the law does allow us to build 50 feet away. There's a small portion of the campus that would allow us, and I'll, and I'll give you the layout and give you a sense of how that would be accomplished. In order to uh, accomplish that, we would have to build a three-story facility. Uh, it, it, would might, it might raise concerns in the neighborhood about having a three-story building in the middle of a residential single stories. Uh, Multi-level uh, building is gonna increase the cost, as you can tell right here, it's $575 a square foot. Uh, we would be eligible, the earliest we believe is 15, 16 school year. We believe we would be eligible for critical hardship of 4.4 million. We estimate the cost to build a new school on that side, a three-story building, to be about 20 million and a quarter. Uh, hardship funding of 4.4, the budget that we have of 5.3, we're short uh, almost 10 and a half million dollars. This gives you a sense of the area that we're talking about. 50 feet away is essentially this portion of the campus. This is approximately one story below grade from Midsdale, San Miguel. So from the street on this side, it would look like a two-story building. From the neighbors on this side, they would fully see a three-story building. Uh, the state will allow us to uh, have playgrounds uh, on this area. One consideration, if this is an option, is we could tear down a portion of the buildings. Um, another option that uh, Terry and I have worked with communities is the state will allow you to convert the existing facilities to community centers, museums, libraries, anything that you want to do with them. You just can't have a K-12 school in there. So one option could be that you do something with the buildings on the frontage, try to preserve the historical aspect of the building, try to preserve the auditorium, and, uh, and try to have a community center for the community, a school in the back, playground down here. Okay. 
So this is a recap that you have. You have the closure of San Rafael with a, a surplus of five million. Um, the relocation to Allendale, approximately 1.1 million surplus. Relocating to Linda Vista is gonna be short about 4.7 million, 4.8. To build at the District Service Center is about $9.2 million short. And uh, to build in a portion of San Rafael is about $10.425 million short. Uh, this is a timeline of what we're proposing to do. Uh, we're here today. We had uh, the meeting, as, as you could tell, our, our shining star was uh, Dr. Jones, and we commented on it. I uh, didn't mean to uh, do that, but this is a very important meeting for us, and we're very pleased that she's here uh, with us. We plan to have community meetings between today and June the 11th. Uh, we are recommending as a staff to have two public hearings in board meetings. There are two board meetings in June 12th and June 26th. Our initial recommendation was to conduct public hearings in, in the board in addition to the community meetings and uh, ask the, staff, the board to make a decision on the options on June 26. The reason we have such an accelerated schedule is not because we feel a sense of emergency and we need to get out. It is because we wanted to capture the attention of the community before you break for summer. We want to get as much input as possible before the summer. Uh, when this decision is made, is not locked in concrete. Uh, much of that will depend on the feedback we get from the community and uh, the will and pleasure of the board. We're done. So uh, at this point, Adam, if we could collect the questions, if we could um, get them involved. Again, this isn't the last opportunity we'll have to ask questions. I've asked staff to stick around. I've asked jo Dr. Jones if she could stick around and Terry Tao to stick around a few minutes afterwards. If any of you have specific questions that you would like to address, we'd be more than glad to try and answer your questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Oh, hello. Thank you so much. I'm going to uh, just kind of read off questions here. If they're best answered by a certain person, I'll call them out. Um, option one referred a reference that the Spanish immersion program would be dispersed. Does this imply that the Spanish immersion students would be split up, or is there any scenario that we're proposing that we'd be disbanding the Spanish immersion program at San Rafael? Superintendent? We've had, we've had no, in no internal discussion of disbanding the program. We, uh, we frequently talk, we meaning I, my staff, and board members about signature programs in our district, and this is one of our signature programs that we, uh, we, we highly value. I think when uh, Mr. Escarga talked about dispersal of students, uh, our idea here was dispersal of students who are not in the dual language program into other uh, schools and trying to find a place to keep the dual language program intact. I'm not saying that this is a viable option because we haven't done any study to determine if this option is chosen, where would that occur? So um, this, this option has not been fleshed out. So uh, if it's seriously considered by the board, we would have to do some study as to exactly what it means in terms of relocation of the program, the dual language program. Please, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna leave it on. Uh, for Chief Escaraga, uh, what will happen to the property of San Rafael if it closes? Okay, can you hear me? I don't know that it has any. Can you hear me? I think you have to talk into the mic for a couple of seconds to activate it. Um, as I indicated earlier, there's several options. Uh, nothing is confirmed. The state does not require you to sell the property. You can uh, lease the property. You can use it as a community center. Um, ultimately, you could uh, uh, declare it surplus and, and uh, either rent or, or sell it. There's uh, several options, but the state does not force you or require you to do anything with the property immediately. Great. Uh, for Mr. Tao and Mr. Ascaraga, I'll get your name right at some point. Ha, you've responded to that there, you've seen similar issues to this in other districts. How quickly were those school populations moved from the active fault sites? With a number of the districts that we've worked with, it depends. It's largely a function of whether or not the district has options. Uh, we had one situation where uh, the faulting was very severe at the site, and we ended up just closing the school almost immediately. We had a similar situation, um, and that was uh, out at uh, 
in kind of the Inland Empire. We had another situation that it was fairly highly publicized uh, over a Morongo Unified School District, and that school district actually did not close down even though it had very severe faulting because there were no other places for the kids to go. Um, and uh, the state does allow you, and the law does allow you to uh, act within a reasonable amount of time in which to work with the structures and to receive state funding and to apply for state funding and to try to um, alleviate or remediate the situation. Obviously, <coughs> you can't, <coughs> excuse me, you can't renovate a building that's on an active earthquake fault, which means that you're looking at alternatives other than at that particular site, which is what we did in the Morongo situation. We've also had a number of other situations, community colleges up in Northern California, a uh, number of schools over, for example, in your old school district where uh, we were kind of obligated to keep those schools open because the state at that time refused to acknowledge earthquake faults as a source of funding. Uh, for repairs. So um, generally speaking, it depends on the uh, resources and abilities of the school district. If the school district has adequate resources, then that means that uh, you need to act faster. If you have inadequate resources, then you act slower. As a quick, quick aside, um, the state typically when they provide you uh, state facilities hardship funds, under 1859.82 of the code, um, they require you to then turn around, and this is my favorite part, and either lease or sell that particular piece of property to somebody else who will then get to use it. You just can't use it as a school. Short answer, in uh, West Contra Costa, Richmond, where Terry and I worked, um, they had a very similar scenario in that they had money. There we had a billion dollars worth of work, uh, significantly more schools than we have here, nearly double the number of schools. Uh, so there was some money available. In some scenarios, we actually moved the school from the top of the hill, 50 feet down to a bottom portion of the hill. Uh, we moved some schools to other locations. Uh, and it took a couple of years. It wasn't overnight. It took probably five or six years at the earliest. Uh, talking to Terry, there's some schools that have been waiting 10, 15 years to identify their funding to actually execute a plan that they have. So it varies. We're fortunate that we have a little bit of money here to do some. Why must the, res the renovations that have been planned at San Rafael be conducted? Um, the, the renovations at San Rafael are, are fairly small. The budget is very small. That uh, 5.3 million isn't a lot of money. It's primarily an elevator. It is not ADA compliant. Somebody in a wheelchair can't go from the first floor to the second floor. That's an issue. That's illegal. As long as you don't touch it, the state will grandfather you. The moment you start touching it, you've got to upgrade. So there were some ADA compliance issues. There were some air conditioning issues, window issues, but it was primarily that elevator. Great. What's the capacity of uh, other options that have been discussed uh, in terms of the capacity of the other schools that have been discussed in terms of Linda Vista, Allendale, or any of the others that we're talking about? Will those be of sufficient size to accommodate the population at San Rafael? Let me have uh, Marlon Noldoni. She's the owner rep and architect on that project. She's the one that did the numbers and calculations on capacity. Um, at, at Allendale, there is currently um, 12 regular classrooms, one kindergarten that are permanent structures at Allendale. And then there are about uh, eight additional uh, portables, relocatables, bungalows, whatever you want to call them. Um, at Linda Vista, um, the existing building had seven classrooms in it. Um, and like I, we said, I, it's been gutted. Um, so those would have to be rebuilt. There is a separate kindergarten. Uh, those are the permanent portions of Linda Vista. And they did have, there were some portables on Linda Vista. So the maximum at Linda Vista built uh, buildings would be nine. Right. We've received quite a number of questions. So I'm going to try to lump them all together here regarding Allendale. And that is that the fault maps that you show show a fault traveling right under Allendale. What, if you can go more in depth in what testing has been done, have you done testing within 50 feet of Allendale to see if that would be something that's been done? Have other 
uh, S-Wave testing been done yes. at Blair or anywhere else in the district? Right. Um, in preparation for the work that was done at Blair Middle School and it also in preparation for the work that is anticipated to be done at the high school, we have done two tests. We did the borings and we also did a trenching. The trenching is, is the technology that was used up until the state accepted uh, the ultrasound test. And the trenching is exactly that. It's about five or six feet wide. It's hundreds of feet long. And you just dig a hole about six feet deep. And an expert goes in and looks at the side of the wall. And they start looking for separation. The technology is different. You don't have to do trenching. It's very destructive. And it's very disruptive to the campus. But both of those tests were done at uh, Blair Middle School in preparation for it in two different angles to identify that there were no fault lines. In terms of S-Wave testing at other schools, has that been done? Say again? The ultrasound testing that you referred to, has I that been done at any no. other schools? The first round of testing that is usually done is boring. And we've done that boring and the state looks at it and if they don't see any anomalies, that's usually good enough. For Dr. Jones, are, the, are all the faults in the San Gabriel Valley mapped and are they known? Is it possible that an active fault exists within close proximity of this school, McKinley, or any other uh, Pasadena school, or all of them? Of course, I can't say how many faults we don't know about, um, but <laughs> Uh, the issue is, you know, when you have a, an unknown fault like produced the Northridge earthquake, we all received the shaking, but nobody had the fault offset issue. And that gets back to this point that what we're trying to avoid here is not seismic shaking. We deal with that by having strong buildings and, and the enforcement of the Field Act. We're just, the issue that needs to make us move out of San Rafael is the fact that there's an active fault trace that'll rupture through. And the unknown faults are ones that don't come to the surface. So uh, they don't have the surface offset in general. I mean, there's always the possibility that there will be some that'll come through, but it's extremely unlikely compared to what we can see. As I said, 20 years ago, I knew that the Eagle Rock Fault was nearby. So this isn't when, you know, this isn't a surprise that, that it's turned out to be right through it. In a couple of the uh, options that have been presented, it would require additional money from the district to make it happen. Where would that money come from? And will money be the ultimately, ultimately be the issue that the district uses to decide on what option to pursue with San Rafael? Let me try and answer part of that question. Uh, money is a big issue, but it is not the ultimate option. Because you don't have the money doesn't mean that you do not accept that option. Many districts have chosen an option and they just have to work towards finding that money, either through bonds, parcels, raising money, figuring it out. So um, in the districts that I've worked in, the decision is not driven solely by the money. It is driven by what is in the best interest of the kids and the students, the students in the school. So that, that, that's an important point. We will not make the decision because it, we're gonna go with the cheapest and I don't think the board is gonna make that decision just based on cost. You know, I, I have a quick issue. Um, the funding issue does become significant with regard to seismic. Uh, there was a study that was done a number of years ago called the AB 300 um, report. And in that study, um, schools throughout the state were identified. Uh, there was a, a, a very large body of schools that potentially, because of the change in, in the way schools are constructed, uh, after the Silmar earthquake, um, those schools were identified as potentially unsafe, requiring additional testing. That study also identified at that time, which was in uh, the early part of the 2000s, that the cost for the repairs was approximately, oh, in a, likely over $4 billion. Um, when you're looking at something uh, as significant as four billion dollars, uh, the state has sh or should have some responsibility for it. Um, interestingly, the state set aside a grand total of 199 and a half million dollars to address the four billion dollar liability. 
The hope is, as the inventory grows of uh, seismically problematic schools throughout the state, not, not just looking individually at San Rafael, that the state will address the seismic inventory. Uh, community colleges, for example, have gone through and addressed a lot of their seismic inventory, but K through 12 districts are sadly behind because of the way the state allocated their funds. Great. Do we have a declaration that the faults under San Rafael are active? When do we anticipate getting it? What happens if it's determined that those faults are in fact not active? The um, reports that we have here uh, in, indicate um, likely active faults, but technically from a legal perspective, what happens is the declaration of active is made by the California Geological Survey. The, those reports that uh, are on the website have all been sent up to California Geological Survey. Our expectation is that there will be a uh, finding of active earthquake faults in all of the situations that we've encountered in the past when the reports look, um, in fact, less than the reports that we have here. Uh, the uh, response from California Geological Survey is that it's an active earthquake fault. The reason why we're acting now is because it's going to be fairly soon that the declaration will come out from California Geological Survey and then we're obligated to act. Do you have an idea when that, how soon is soon? And what um, would happen in the off chance that it is not active? Uh, I, I would not know how soon is soon, but uh, my impression is it's uh, typically, you might know. I, I, a month or two. Um, yeah. I, I would think that it's gonna be you know, within a month or two, it takes a review of the report. The fundamental issue that they're looking at is what's the age of the material that the fault has moved. If you see that the fault has broken apart a sediment that's less than 11,000 years old, that's what makes it be determined active. And if that's what's in the report being sent up to them, the only way it wouldn't be declared active is because they found some reason not to believe the work that had been done. And I don't think there's any reason to expect that to happen. I, th I think that it's. That's discussed in detail in your peer review and also in the letter to Hydrolog. And if you're going to use that property for any other use, children or otherwise, you should figure out if it's active or not. When did it last slip? Those are buried faults. They won't offset the school, but they could be dangerous, but it would be incumbent to determine if they're active. Don't you think? Well, that's part of this process. Part of the process. Has any carbon-14 dating been done on the section? I don't get that impression. I believe it's being extrapolated from the types of sediments that are there and the fact that, that's, that the characteristic of it looks like uh, you know, recent, recent sediment, something that's been you know, deposited by a, a recent stream. But that's going to be part of what the review that CGS does on it. You don't need to have 50 feet of sediment on it. That is. And that could easily have been deposited in 20,000 years, especially if there were hiatuses. Uh, so it seems to me it's indeterminate unless you get some kind of carbon-14 dates and see if there's an unconformity between that sediment cover and where the faults terminate and see if there's any evidence of the faults causing folding in that sediment because that would be a later event. Right. I, I'm, I'm certainly not the expert in that field, but I, I can comment this. The process that we follow is not a process that we define. It's a process that's given to us by the state. CGS says, this is what I need you to do. This is the test. If they determine additional tests is done, as they have, then they will require us to do that. Can, can, 
I, the, I, the question that was asked was the peer review indicate does not indicate an active earthquake fault. Uh, the peer review says that there may be an active earthquake fault and uh, the only party that could determine whether or not it's truly active le legally is California Geological Survey. In my experience with them, the, what we see here is likely to result in a determination of active. Um, we are dealing with uh, recently allowed technology, which is this uh, uh, methodology with, uh, with the, uh, the sonar. So it's different than what it is that you're typically used to with the deep trenching. So you're, you may be right. CGS may come back and say, we want you to go ahead and dig a large trench so that we can see it and do the carbon-14 dating. We have a, another question about the dual language program there. Uh, the option recap chart regarding the total cost to re relocate looks at the physical costs. The uniqueness of this issue is that the school is home to a new dual language immersion Spanish program. What is the district thinking or support, uh, regarding support, retention, and expansion of this special program? Dr. McDonald? Or superintendent, either way. I, I didn't hear the first part of the question. Jet, the option, basically, the options look at the cost, you know, the physical dollar cost, but what about the cost of the program not expanding? What costs or impact would we see or could we expect to the dual language programs? Well, it depends on which one of the options is selected. Um, but as I said earlier, uh, we have a very strong interest in maintaining and growing the program, so that's a uh, part of what will be taken into consideration when an option is selected. If the building isn't safe, what should parents and students plan for? Is there a robust emergency evacu evacuation plan for the school and neighborhood? Mr. Davis? I'm going to switch to turn it on. Actually, before, before it gets addressed very quickly, there's not yet been a determination that the building is unsafe. There's not yet been a determination that the building is unsafe. However, I think we may want to talk about the emergency plan. There are emergency plans for all facilities within the district. That's one of the more safer schools because the principal there runs them very well. And she makes sure they're done quite well and there is written plans for all contingencies of this sort of thing. But you can never plan for anything completely. So you do the best you can with what we have and have different drills running constantly. Since it's elementary school, it's done monthly. Some of the options uh, show move-in dates later than 2013, 2014. Where would students go in the meantime? Would they stay at the school or what would they do? They would, they would stay at the San Rafael site. Yes. Stay in the current site. The old or main building at San Rafael was built before the field act, but all the other portions of the school are post field act. When were the newer portions of the school built and were they built according to the field act? Repeat the question. Now. When were, the parts of the school were built pre field act. Yes. Um, but other portions were built post field act. Correct. When were the newer portions built, and were they built according to the Field Act? We think we've got the data. The, uh, the two-story uh, cafeteria auditorium building was built in 1950, uh, as well as the front building that faces Nithsdale. Um, the other buildings, I'm pretty sure, were built about the same time. The, the only other building on campus is, uh, which is concrete uh, walls and a, um, a flexible diaphragm, which is the floors and, um, and the roof, is the two-story cafeteria building. The other buildings are all single-story wood frame structures. So, Who has the final decision, or who has the final say on the decision to close San Rafael? What is the process, essentially, who is the final word on whether the school gets closed or not? The final decision will be made by the school board. And uh, after you know, public comment, a couple of public hearings at, at a minimum, and uh, I will make a recommendation to the school board and then they will make the final decision. Why can't 
the school be moved? Why can't it be moved to a school that was closed this past school year when we did the last round of school closures? Or the round before that, for that matter. What, if I could comment. One of the considerations that the staff tried to do is to try and keep the options as close to the existing school as possible. We did the maps to try and show relationship. We did not uh, consider a school that is deep in the district, such as Burbank and uh, Loma Alta. And there's a couple of schools that are even closer before we even got to that. That's certainly a possibility. The board could decide to uh, reopen those schools and read boundaries and change all the boundaries. That was not a consideration that we had. If that's an option that comes up in the community meetings and a direction, we certainly would be willing to do that. But we tried to look at all the options that would keep the community as close as possible to, to the existing facility, accommodating the west side of the district. If an option selected that um, San Rafael will stay open through 2014-15 or beyond, what improvements will be made at the campus in the meanwhile, including playground and other structures? I've had that conversation with uh, the leadership of the school, the parent leadership, and, and the um, administration. We cannot touch the building. I cannot physically touch anything inside the building structural, but there's uh, no reason why we can't do improvements uh, uh, outside place structures, uh, trees, shades, grass. Uh, I, I know they've been asking for that for some time, and I had to explain to them until we understand what the plan is now that we're very close to it. I've already said we've actually started the dialogue. I've got the head of uh, the grounds and facilities has already engaged them. They've dug up a hole. They know where they want to put trees. So that process can, can work. It would be a minimal expense. It would not adversely impact their budget. And we're going to do everything we possibly can to try and make the quality of life between now and whenever they have to move or decide what, where they want to go um, as, as well as we can possibly make it. You mentioned that the Allendale is a temporary campus, but I think you've clarified that it's a temporary campus for Blair if Sam Rafael yes. um, relocates there, it would obviously be a permanent campus. Yes. Do you also see that as the permanent location for the DLP? The constant uncertainty and possibility of relocation affects retention of current families and our ability to recruit new families. Well, I, I would ask the superintendent. The effect of what? In other words, the dual language program would be permanent there, is that the question? Yes. If, if all, all of these options that we discussed, we're talking about permanent. We're not talking about moving you temporarily and five years later you're moving you somewhere else. Uh, that's certainly an option, but uh, whether the program would, would stay there, I, I'd leave uh, the superintendent and the academics. Well, I, w I would say yes. I mean, that would be the purpose of moving the program into uh, Allendale or Linda Vista, if that's chosen, uh, my expectation would be that we're choosing a permanent site for the program. Mm -hmm. yes. All options mean that the current students will be in a weaker building near a fault for two to five years. How can we keep our kids safe while we wait? Just remember, nothing has changed. The earthquake fault it didn't just get invented at the uh, edges of the San Rafael site. This earthquake fault has existed as known. Um, the maps have always shown this fault, except not on this site. Um, and it's the testing that has shown this fault to exist. The reality is, I mean, this, and I hate saying it this way, we don't know when an earthquake is going to hit. More likely than not, the hope is that an earthquake would not hit on that particular fault during this period of time. But the way the law is written, the intent is to get you off of those sites where you're on an active earthquake fault so that you don't have to suffer the consequences of if that particular fault um, goes into play. That was uh, some of what I was trying to express at the beginning. If the average return period on the fall to several thousand years, um, chances are, you know, the chances of it happening in any one year are extremely low. And I knew the fault was somewhere close to this when I had my kids there and I didn't pull them out because of it. The difference here is talking about investing money to create a building that are going to have many generations of future students. And then your chances of having it in the next 100 years are, are basically 100 times greater than having it in any one year. And you know, you've got to balance out the risks and all of the benefits that go there. And that uh, you know, 
you haven't changed your seismic risk, and it's, uh, it was enough to make me nervous and not enough to make me lose, leave the school. And, uh, but I wouldn't, you know, just investing in, in many generations is a whole different issue. I just wanted to reiterate a comment that was said earlier, I believe Dr. Jones said it very well, uh, that the, the school at San Rafael is an older school, but the standards to which it was built and retrofitted and brought up is a meeting field act, which means that the design standard of the school is safer or at least as safe as your home right across the street. You probably have a better chance of surviving in the building than in a home. The only facilities that have comparable building standards would be hospitals, fire station, those type of buildings. So the school is as safe as anything else in that community. Does section 17212.5 require that a school be closed? It does not. The section requires that you not build on uh, active uh, or trace fault. Uh, we're working with uh, what's called the design immunity statute, which is government code section 830.6, which places personal liability on the board members if they do not act in the face of an unsafe condition. Considering that Allendale only has 12 classrooms plus one kinder classroom, and then there's an additional six to eight classrooms currently housed in temporary buildings, would those temporary buildings be torn down, and could we get critical hardship money from the state to build new permanent classrooms? Um, the current, um, uh, the current uh, portables that are on Allendale, uh, some of them, I believe, were used as kindergarten portables. There is only one kindergarten, that's accurate. Um, but I, I believe that when the campus was active, there was more than one kindergarten there. So they may need some retrofitting uh, as far as restrooms, uh, but we would maintain and we would uh, upgrade and keep the portables on campus. Along those same lines, when is San Rafael eligible for state funding? How does that process work? State funding is governed by a section called 1859.2. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that section addresses if you should have a determination that the structure is unsafe. That's the moment the California Geological Survey declares that the um, that there is an active fault, which is our expectation, then you can uh, go to the state allocation board in Sacramento and ask them for a piece of the uh, state funding for what's called facilities hardship. And um, it's based on the uh, number of students going to that particular school with a, with a set amount of state funding, depending on where you're going to move the school. Um, you would then, um, uh, lock down the funds with uh, construction plans and the uh, approval of DSA once submitted to the state allocation board would make the school district eligible for 50% uh, of the state funding based on the eligibility of the school. Are one of the fault, active fault lines uh, that pass through San Rafael, the San Andreas Fault? If so, isn't the San Andreas Fault more likely to erupt according to recent research? Um, the San Andreas Fault is far more likely to uh, erupt, however, it's located out around Palmdale. Um, there are, the San Andreas is the most active fault, but it uh, doesn't come uh, into this side of the San Gabriel Mountains. Uh, we have, in the city of Pasadena, there's about five or six active faults, all of them having earthquakes, much less frequently the San Andreas. I said one to two, you know, a few thousand years. The San Andreas has them on average every hundred years. Does the school district have an agenda on where they would like the San Rafael community to go? Repeat, repeat. Does the district have an agenda or an opinion on where they would like San Rafael, what option they would like for San Rafael? No, that's the purpose of these uh, public meetings and public hearings is to uh, hear public feedback before that kind of decision is made. It would, it would undermine the process if we already knew what we were going to be going to do. 
What's the difference between now and 20 years ago when these faults were discovered? I'm a lot older. <laughs> I'm older? Um, no, the, the difference is, is getting in and actually doing the investigation to see exactly where the fault goes. Um, the, and this is this, this issue, I realized, part of the activity issue, the Eagle Rock Fault is recognized as a very active feature at the sites at, at the La Loma Bridge and at the Eagle Rock. And so the, the presumption is, is that in between you've also got the active feature. And before you did these studies, you just knew that they were somewhere around the area. Once you've done these studies, you know exactly where they are. If San Rafael closes, what will happen to its current teachers and future principal? That, that again depends on the option that's selected. If, if uh, one of the um, vacant schools is selected, for example, the teachers and the principal will simply move in, uh, as a group into the new site. San Rafael School is currently the only school in Council District 6. Is it possible under the new school district lines under Measure A that there would be no school for the council and the school district in that area? Depending on the option that's selected, yes, that is a possibility. We're uh, working through these here. Uh, what work has been done to date during the, what, I'm sorry, let me start again. What work has been done to date the last time the faults under the school slipped? In other words, if the fault is active or potentially active, the peer review indicates the last date of the fault slippage is under, is undeterminate. Right. Um, yeah, the, the big issue is that at the other places we can see this fault, we can see that it's, it appears to be uh, active in the Holocene, and most of the models of how you get Pasadena to, to accommodate all the faults that it has uh, requires that the Eagle Rock be an active fault, because it's getting fed by known active faults. The Raymond can be easily mapped as active, and it appears to move into this area. That's how we think the Raymond gets accommodated. So it's uh, potentially indirect, and you'd have more confirmation with, with um, extra tests. Um, but I would find it difficult, no matter what was found there, to think that the Eagle Rock is not an active structure because of how it fits into the overall picture of the region. Can you get the microphone? I went to the SCEC site and it said uh, Eagle Rock Fault had estimated slip less than 0.1 millimeters per year, I think, same as San Rafael. So in your knowledge of the faults, would that indicate that the SCEC site is uh, in need of updating and that's an old value? Um, it's an indeterminate value. They're right that it's small and it's the same level as the Newport Inglewood Fault. All right. If the anomaly was first discovered in 2011, why, why is it already May 2012 that I'm first hearing about this? It appears the issue was known by the school district for months and, I, and was sat on uh, to withhold information from the community. Hold on. Let me ask you to please repeat uh, the question. Sure. If the, anomaly was, if the anomaly was first discovered in 2011, why is it already May 2012 that I'm first hearing about this? It appears that the issue was known by the school district for months and was sat on while it, and information was withheld from the community. All right, well, the district has not sat on any information. The moment we found information, we moved on to the next step. Some of the tests required some delays, like the test for the ultrasounds. There was a delay in trying to get permits and get the work done. The moment one step is done, we move on to the next step. And the moment we found the actual verification from peer review, within 24 hours, we went to the board, informed them of this situation, and this whole process has started. So to my knowledge of what I've seen, although it appears that it takes a long time, it takes a while to do all the borings, the testings, the ultrasounds, um, in order to get to this point. So I have no knowledge of any deliberate, let's sit on it. There's nothing to be gained by that from my standpoint. We need to get the information out. We need to make a decision.
have been okay to say it's an anomaly, we need to do further testing, it's okay, the answer, I don't know, can you tell us that next time? So we don't go through the effort. I've known several of these people here that spent hours and hours unpaid trying to get money for our kids. That's what makes me so upset with you guys. You don't understand how to communicate. And we need that from you, for our children, for us, so we can guide them, so we can make the right decisions. Got it. Current law prohibits money being spent on the buildings if it's determined to be an act of fault. What if the air conditioning breaks down or it, the heating? Can repairs be done? Leaky roofs, doors falling off hinges, etc. Yes. Uh, the state does allow you to do maintenance on, on existing facilities. Anything that breaks down, we can go in there and do repairs. We just can't do upgrades and new modernization to the building. But yes, roof repairs, air conditioning, floor. Uh, the maintenance department is, uh, is accepting, has always accepted and will continue to any routine maintenance that needs to be done to sustain the plant. How long has this been an issue? How s soon will San Rafael really be closed? Is it a coincidence that just two weeks ago the principal sent out letters to families informing them that she will not be returning in the next school year? Are all those related? No. All right, we have just a couple more, uh, and uh, we'll try to end here on time. Uh, why, or has, why has more study not been called for yet? Is more study needed, or is the district satisfied with the results that they've received to move forward? The requirements for the study are actually dictated by um, the Division of State Architect and the requirements um, that are uh, set forth with DSA uh, from California Geological Survey. So we have gone through and done the testing that's been requested. Um, one of the uh, examples that was pointed out is um, we believe because California Geological Survey allows the ultrasonic testing uh, as a means of determining active earthquake faults that that will be a final determination on their part once the reports are sent up to them. However, um, it very well may be that they might require trenching to uh, a carbon date, uh, but that's not what our expectation is. What is the process for getting staff to study other school sites that have been closed in the past few years or for the public in general to suggest other options for San Rafael? It will be the community forums. Uh, we will go through the communications office. We will publish all the meetings, what the location is going to be, and that's the opportunity to get all the feedback from the community. How will this shortfall be met if one of the more expensive plans are chosen? That, that, would be, that would be part of the decision that had to be made by the board when they select that option. They'd have to identify how they're going to pay for it. Why does Ed Code 172, I'm sorry, 17212.5 apply? Does it apply to this, why does it apply to this situation that we're seeing in San Rafael? 17212 uh, is actually a um, education code section and it's applicable to all schools. Um, the uh, California Department of Education requirements start at uh, Education Code Section 17210 and addresses all the different requirements, such as whether or not you're near a hazardous waste site, whether or not you're near um, uh, a uh, major freeway or uh, uh, air quality problem and the like. Where is it documented that uh let me read this entire. The peer review paper states that it it's, remains to be determined whether the construction prohibitions apply and recommends further study. How and when is the district determined the prohibitions apply? Where is it documented? I, I think we've already answered the question to, to some extent. It's going to be a determination by California Geological Survey. And uh, last question here. It's also regarding the determination. Does anyone else have any other cards that... Uh, they'd like me to read or other questions that, that they have. I want to make sure everyone uh, does this. All right. I, I, just wanted to thank, I just wanted to thank you all. It's been really helpful. I appreciate it personally. Um, with regard to the 17212.5 issue, my concern is 
you know, not to be overly legalistic, although I am a little bit, that reconstruction and construction are undefined with regard to that statute. Um, and it has never been interpreted, as far as I can tell, by any case. Uh, and given those things, it's unclear to me why putting in a new elevator would even constitute reconstruction or con construction under 17212.5. But I'm not an expert, so uh, please, please enlighten me. Thank you very much. Okay, you're going to hate me for this one. Uh, there is actually, I was just going to look it up. Uh, there is actually a um, Division of State Architect Interpretive Regulation, which I happen to have here in front of me. It's Interpretive Regulation A-4. You can go to the DSA website and look it up. That uh, um, regulation uh, requires uh, this geological testing when you're in a special study zone. And this area um, in Pasadena happens to be in the Alcos Priolos special study zone. So if you look at IRA-4, which is a regulation that was developed from 17212.5 of the Education Code, um, that is actually where uh, the requirement for the testing originated from. It used to be, if you went back approximately five years, uh, it used to be that no testing was required other than your basic soils test. Um, since that time, uh, the state has uh, added additional requirements to um, uh, test for geological and seismic issues um, when even fairly minor construction occurs. I actually think that the statute itself is very clear that the studies are required with regard to any alterations, renovations, anything whatsoever. It's the subsequent paragraph where it talks about the prohibitions, where it leaves out the word alterations and renovations, and it only talks about reconstruction and construction, which are not defined in the statute. Here's the reality of what will happen. When you go to Division of State Architect to ask for any sort of uh, construction on the site, um, they will just refuse to allow you to get a permit, so you won't get to build, um, is what will actually occur. Um, we actually uh, tried to do it at one of the sites uh, because we wanted to do some renovations um, to the school, and they just refused, and they issued us a letter. And this was one of the reasons why we don't want to just go straight to DSA and say, hey, well, um, this is what's going on. They issued us a letter saying the site was unsafe immediately. So um, that, that was not something that we actually really were too happy with at this other school district. So I just want to thank you all for coming. The panel will be around if you want to ask them more questions individually. I uh, encourage you all to go to srfaults.pasadenausd.org. The, this uh, community meeting has been recorded by KLEARN. It will be up on the website tomorrow, so uh, be streamed there if you'd like to see any of it or get any other questions answered. Um, we're going to take input from this to plan our future uh, community meetings, and uh, I thank you all for coming. Thank you.